all cops that have, I think everyone, everyone in society has been through some traumatic thing. It's traumatic to them in some way. There's no doubt about it. So I don't want to make it seem like mine is like so crazy that no one's ever had that. But I also want like, don't use that as a crutch. Use that as something that's positive and you can move forward from it. I feel that a lot of people will use that as like a whoa me type moment when I try to use it as like something that motivates me to be better at everything I do because I don't want to end up like that. Hey guys, don't forget to check out the Street Cop Training Conference April 23rd through the 28th, 2023 at the Gaylord Opryland Resort and Convention Center. It's going to be a great experience. Five career-changing days. Some of the most profound speakers in the industry. Guest speakers include Rob O'Neill, the guy who killed Bin Laden, Kyle Carpenter, the youngest living Congressional Medal of Honor winner, Fox News host Tommy Laren, Navy SEAL American War Hero Jason Redman, Sheriff David Clark, Sheriff Mark Lamb, and Sheriff Wayne Ivey. You'll also spend time with all of our Street Cop instructors at this event Monday through Friday. We'll have a great lineup of courses in addition to our great speakers. It will be a week that you will not forget. You'll be thankful you came. You don't want to miss out. Check out streetcop.com on how to register. If you're going to use the room code, make sure you book it from Sunday through Friday. That's what the code's good for, and it's about half the price of the regular rate. But those rooms are running out, so make sure you sign up now. We'll see you there. Hey everybody, Heather Gologlitch, uh, street cop instructor for the Complete Female Cop. You're with Kenny Williams, that teaches interdiction mastermind. I am with you, <laughs> which is incredible. I, I actually want to do an intro here of what we're going to talk about because I have to be very transparent. When I first met you, I was kind of still just starting here at Street Cop. I was getting like my onboarding intro and I show up and I had no idea you were going to be here and you were standing outside and you were on the phone. And as I'm walking down the hallway, I was like, oh my gosh, it's Kenny Williams. It's like the Red Ninja. What's he doing here? Because you don't expect you to just be in Jersey, right? We just, we don't expect that. And you actually reached out to me and you were like, yeah, I know who you are. You know, I've seen you on social media. And I was like, oh my gosh, Kenny Williams knows who I am. So, and I know that makes you really embarrassed. And Yeah, it makes me feel very awkward and I don't even know how to follow that up. So, Well, it's we, funny because we'll you're turning we're, red. We're going to get rid cute. of that. <laughs> <laughs> we're definitely not going to edit it. But the, the reason I just want to say that is because I think I will never be one of those people that takes for granted our positions here at this company and the impact that we have. And not knowing anybody really other than Dennis and Tom prior to really becoming a part of this company. I knew who they were and I knew what they were about. And obviously Tom Rizzo is probably the most humble person I've ever met in my life. You still think somebody with your accolades and the things that you've done would maybe just not be as approachable as you are. So I think it's incredible. I just think it's a really good testament of the person that you are. But also now I just feel like you're one of my favorite people that I don't get to spend time with in person. And we get to talk all the time. And I've learned some things about you, which is where this podcast is really coming about coming from. I appreciate all those nice things. I feel like you're just making me my, me sound better than I really am. But I do appreciate all that That's stuff. That's not true. All, true. All of it is it, true, which is, which is even greater, right? Uh, but today we're going to talk about trauma. And I think so many people feel like trauma breaks everybody down. But I think in your past and in my past, trauma has actually built us into the people that we are. No, I completely agree. I think trauma, you can use it as a a superpower, I guess, or you can use it as a crutch. And I feel that everyone goes through trauma. Everyone goes through it. And it just depends on, I guess, the severity of the trauma and how you deal with it. But I feel that no matter what, outside even the police world, you're going to have traumatic things that happen in your life. And it's uh, it's how you bounce back from it that, that builds your character. And I feel that if you use it to your advantage, uh, I feel that you will become a great person. If you use it as a crutch, you're always going to rely on that and you're always going to blame any negative thing that happens in your life on that crutch. But if you use it as a positive way to move forward, to help yourself and like educate others, I, th- I think that that is a, a great way to look at the, the trauma that you everyone deals with. Yeah. And I mean, my class is a little different. I think people have some expectations of my class when they show up. They think that there's going to be this tactical aspect of how to be a female cop. And really, a lot of my stuff encompasses like what makes up all all of women in law enforcement, but officers also. And I talk about a lot of my trauma and how, you know, it happened professionally and personally and how I made a choice 
to not continue to be a victim, right? And so that just falls right in line with what you're saying and how we just kind of can move forward. And it is a choice. I really do believe it's a choice. There's definitely people out there that deal with things like depression and, and some mental health issues where sometimes the way that they act and react and think and their mindset isn't something that they have as much control over. But in in my case, I just, I can't sit back and allow myself to be re-victimized from the trauma. Uh, yeah, and I, and I agree there though. I mean, if you're having some type of, um, I guess, genetic psychological issues with depression, and that's that's something completely different. I feel like and traumatic things can bring that out of you, but I feel that if it's not something like that's psychologically genetically with you where, and, and it's just a traumatic incident, I feel that those are the ones that I'm talking about. I'm not talking about something that's genetically that you, yeah. you, know, you know, that you're, you know, pre- disposed to some type of um, traumatic brain injury or something like that where like it's genetics that that's something completely different i'm talking about something that happens to your life that causes you to go into this depression and it's whether you're going to bounce out of that or you're going to stay in that rut yeah so a lot of people already know my story if they don't i can get into it but are you comfortable talking about your history yeah i'll talk about it um I feel that my history kind of motivates me to do what I do, so I don't mind speaking about it. I'm probably going to be a little more vague than than you are, but I'll, I will talk about it in just a little bit vague terms. So uh, when I was a child, um, my mom and my dad were married for a total of three months. Um, I was conceived. They got married and they got divorced prior to me even being born. Um, and so my dad got custody of me at a very young age. And um, as life goes on, I would go visit my mom, two completely different worlds and two completely different ways of bringing up children, I guess. It was, it was, it was, it was surprisingly different, shockingly different. And uh, as life goes on, I start to see that certain people in my family start to have uh, substance abuse issues. At a young age, I realized that like what's right and what's wrong. So uh, at a certain age, I stopped uh, um, spending a lot of time with one of my family members and uh early in my high school young college years i was kind of lost i didn't really know what i was going to do and um 9 11 happened my one of my buddy, best friends became a cop and uh, i was in school to be a teacher and i was like all right i want to be a cop now um because i actually was going to go to the military my grandparents said like beg me not to go to the military um they're like we'll pay for your college all this other thing so i was like all right cool then I want to be a cop. Going through that, I've had some up and ups and downs in college, and um, yeah, I've had failures. We all have failures, so I've had failures where um, I was arrested, I was charged with some things, nothing crazy, all misdemeanor stuff. But then, um, about the age of twenty-two, I realized that like I didn't want to be like my family members had substance abuse problems, so I went into law enforcement. And then going through the law enforcement process. Um, I love the ability to have an impact on my community where I feel that when it comes to narcotics, if I can impact and prevent someone from using narcotics and get them help, um, and now even at this scale where I'm working in addiction, if I can stop those narcotics from getting into a community, I feel that it all comes full circle. And maybe if someone was doing that, my family members that have substance abuse or had substance abuse issues would not have had them or prevented them or if there was someone that would have gave them guidance um, when they were on that, you know, their user, I guess, trend of life that gave them some guidance on how to get help for themselves that maybe they wouldn't be in the position that they are. So a lot of it comes full circle seeing as a young kid, seeing substance abuse, um, not knowing what it was as a kid, kid, but then high school years, you start to understand what it is and then progressing on. It's full circle for me. So now I'm trying to prevent other kids having to deal with that in, in their life. And it, the only way I can think about stopping that is stopping it from getting to the people that have those issues. It's really incredible. It actually gives me a lot of hope. So, uh, you know, my two older kids, we I shared custody with my ex-husband who uh, had a substance abuse issue. Uh, and his was alcohol and really bad. And they were 20 months and eight months old when we split. And listen, I grew up in a family that was literally like leave it to beaver. And I mean, my mom for the first time, I think got drunk at my wedding on half of a white Russian. Like there was no alcohol in our home. My dad grew up with an alcoholic mom, uh, you know, who smoked all the time and 
and I mean cigarettes, uh, but, you know, it was just a different environment. My dad was very much dead set on our home being somewhere that was just a safe haven. And, you know, they're still together, you know, 45 years later, it's, you know, so completely opposite of what you went through. And my trauma didn't happen until I was old enough, older and in my own relationship. And, but I worry about my kids, my older two a lot, because I feel as though everything that they've seen that I haven't been able to prevent is going to affect them in a negative way. And it just, it's kind of inspiring for me to sit here and hear your story and see who you are and what you've become and, and the mindset that you have and that it was a choice that you made to be better and do better because, you know, I, here I am trying to always balance it out with them. Right. And I have their whole life. Like since they were 20 months and eight months old, I've always worried about, am I doing enough to be a positive influence on my kids where they're going to make a good choice? Or are they going to, you know, be predisposed to an addiction issue like their father was? It's, it's, it's like a scary environment for me. I mean, I think that you, yeah, I don't know. I, I don't think that your kids are going to have any issues. And, and with your traumatic stuff, though, that that's a, a different realm. Like, my, that was n nowhere near the traumatic stuff that I had to deal with. Um, I had to deal with a younger age, but it's not anything anything to the extent of the, the situation that you were in. But um, for me, as a, as a kid, though, like, I, I feel like I learned right from wrong at a very young age. And... Um, I knew what I wanted to be in life and not, and I, and I knew what I, I didn't want to be in life. So, um, beyond the substance abuse, there was also like, not like crazy physical abuse that, that I don't know if I say, but that yeah. you, that you dealt with. Yeah. Um, but like as a young child, I saw, you know, um, abuse of men on women and I absolutely hate it. Like even to this day, like I, um, it very, it frustrates me. I mean, it, I'm not gonna lie. It makes me angry. Like when I see men abusing women or kids, it's something I just don't understand. I can't fathom. It's, uh, I can understand the whole drug dealing game or theft or anything like that. That like you're doing it for a monetary gain. I can't understand men that harm kids and women. It like, it, it infuriates me. It really does. And, uh, something I can't wrap my head around. And I saw that as a young, younger kid, I guess. So, um, and I knew that that's, that's something at that age, I'm like, ah, never, like I would never do that to a woman like that's crazy yeah. to me so i think that with with your kids there's no way that they would oh, not gonna win but i don't I, you know yeah I, I i think that you set a good example of what's right and what's wrong and i think most kids are gonna always gonna be like well this is what i want to be i definitely don't want to be that and that's kind of where i was at where it's like i knew it from a very young age and i knew that that's not what i wanted to be yeah and maybe not aspire to be exactly like someone else but it was better than that kind of I mean, I know you don't have kids and I think, you know, I get asked this question so much by people, like, how do you balance being a cop and like wanting to be in charge of who your kids end up being because you know what's out there, right? Like, I think my biggest fear as a parent is that one of my kids is going to be addicted to drugs. Like it, it legitimately is, especially with heroin being as prevalent as it is. Like that is literally one of my biggest fears. And, uh, the other one is like one of my kids being sexually assaulted or, or killed before I do, before I die. Like those are just, the, those are my only fears in life. Otherwise I really don't, I'm not scared of anything. And my kids have this predisposition to addiction because of their father. And I just think that it's just a really hard balance because, I wonder whether or not I'm always doing the right thing, you know, and it has grown. Right. And you talk about your trauma being younger and mine being as I was older. I mean, I was 24 years old, 25 years old, and I had no idea who the hell I was. And I quote unquote allowed things in my life that I probably shouldn't have. So there's regrets there. Right. And there's so much regret, but at the same time, I, I can't think that way. Cause I have these two fantastic kids from this monster right? And once they were 20 months and eight months old and we separated, I had to really learn how to parent in a way that I allowed them to know that they could make their own decisions on certain things without being the person that manipulated them because that was just thrown at me all the time. So from a young age, I taught them like, no matter what, no matter what relationship, if it does not serve you, you don't have to keep it in your life. And that includes me. And I use myself as an example. And I said, you know, if I, I hope that's not, I, I hope I'm beneficial to you and you love me and I, I'm doing all the right things to help you be the best version of yourself. But if at a point you get in your life and you think, you know, she is really just somebody who isn't benefiting me and she's causing more stress, like I give you permission to let me go. And really that was my way of teaching them to let go of their father when I knew that they would figure out that was the time. 
And man, it just now 42 years old and this isn't really public knowledge yet, but it's easier to talk about now that certain things have happened. Like in April, my, my son was still seeing my ex-husband and, uh, the day before Easter, he beat him for 15 minutes. And I'm telling you right now, whether I was a cop or I was not, I was pretty close to taking things into my own hands because don't touch my children. And then my son threw up and he ended up having a concussion. So we were at the hospital and, and, you know, everything happens and doesn't for a reason. But you talk about like the amount of rage I had and trying to balance that with also showing up for work and then having to deal with the court system and all the things that just really are meant to break me <laughs> and in fact have like really motivated me to do more. But just, you know, seeing that change, like, and it's hard for me to talk about, and my son Hunter will attest to this, but I didn't like him for a really long time, my son. And not up until really April, like I loved him. I've always loved him, but he was very much like his father. And sometimes it was even hard to look at him because he'd get like this look on his face sometimes. And that's all this trauma that goes with that. And that you talk about trauma and people think, oh, it's a one-time thing. But especially as cops, we are re-traumatized so much with the things that we see and we deal with and, and things just creep into your brain that you can't really handle. And so it was very uncool for him to love his mom. And so we just had a lot of tension. He was never in, engaged in our family. You know, there were conversations I would have with my husband where I was like, man, maybe we should just let him go live with my ex-husband. And how hard of a decision is that, knowing that he would obviously turn out way worse if he was with him? And obviously I didn't, but, uh, you know, that day changed everything. Uh, so much so that he just, I, I saw him really reflect the good that I had been trying to teach him. Uh, he's like, no, you know, I know I'm safe now that I'm with you, but I need to make sure he can't do this to anybody else. And your son said that? Yeah. That's and awesome. uh and then like out of nowhere he just like apologizes, right? He uh he's like, I'm I'm so sorry for acting like I didn't believe you with everything that happened. Cause he knew he had found everything on uh on a website one time. And it's just it was all this stuff. And I, I think I think people don't realize that as cops, we are humans and we are dealing with all this extra shit all the time. No matter what, like no life is perfect, right? And I think people are like, oh my gosh, Kenny Williams is so good at what he does. He must be really lucky. Oh my gosh, he has a dog, right? Like that's what it comes down to. Sometimes people are just so ignorant in the amount of work that goes into it. But I think people are also ignorant. And when I mean ignorant, I don't even mean that in a negative way. I think they just don't know. Like you're motivated by so much more with what you do. And there's a passion behind the things that you do and the amount of drugs you pull off the road and the way you talk to people. And, you know, I, I think people really dismiss that human aspect of how we are so good at what we do sometimes. Uh, yeah, I'm going to unpack some of that. So I, I feel awful for you and I feel bad <laughs> for your son. So I'm so sorry that they do have to uh, deal with that nonsense. Uh, I was mad when you just said that, uh, very mad. Yeah. Um, as far as the regret thing, I, I try to not to use anything as regret. Like, have I made mistakes? Absolutely. Have I made mistakes that maybe costed me some time where I should have got hired before I did. Yeah, I made mistakes. So like, but I used that as a learning experience. And I knew that I would never do that again. And I knew how to help people that were going through that same situation. So I don't look at things as regrets, no matter if I made a wrong step or not. Um, I try to use that as just a, a learning experience and moving forward, even if it's not for me, like, yeah, I fucked that up. I'm never going to do it again. But now if I can tell you or prevent someone else from getting in that same thing, I don't regret it. I've already made the mistake. I'm going to prevent you from falling into that, that mistake. Yeah. Um, some things that like I've learned as a, I, God, God blessed me with very few things. Like, uh, the ability to talk in front of people we were just talking about, I, like, I don't have that. Uh, I took like this, uh, leadership class in DC a few months ago and I found out that I'm like a huge introvert. Um, and that my personality traits are, most common along females in the United States. It was like, so that was, that was kind of cool that I got to stand up in front of uh, 30 leaders in the law enforcement world and say, yeah, that's who I am. Like, you know, like, <laughs> but, but it, it was, so like, I learned a lot about myself, uh, but God did bless me with the ability. Like, I don't know why, like I have this ability to write people that have done me wrong off. Like, and I don't lose sleep over. Like, it's just like, you're here and you're not. And I'm completely fine with it. Like, I just feel like, I made that mistake of having you in my life and then something happened and you broke that trust or whatever that was. 
I'm I'm not the person that is going to try to rebuild that, right or wrong. It's just like I've been through so much of it. Sometimes I realize, well, now I realize that like the time and effort to rebuild this relationship isn't going to benefit me in the long run because I have a feeling that you're going to do this again. So that's one great thing that God blessed me with. I could literally have the ability to write people off and just be done like forever. Like it's, I don't know, that sucks. Like, but obviously all, either we grew apart or our personalities didn't match or you did something to uh, lose your, lose. I lost my trust within you. Um, so that's one thing that I have. So I don't, I don't often reflect about the people that I've, I've you know, kind of cut off in my life. Um, but I learned that at a very young age that, that God blessed me with that. And I think it's an also way that he deals with, I deal with my trauma. So I see something traumatic. Um, this might sound inhumane or whatever, but when I, uh, if I, I don't like seeing dead bodies, I don't, that's something that always makes me uncomfortable. But when I see like an elderly person that kind of passed away on their own, the way I, I rationalize it in my brain, so I don't have to relive that is like, I see them as Mr. Burns from the Simpsons. Like, I don't know why that's just like something. Cause I, I love the Simpsons. So I'm like, Oh, you know, like, but if, the first couple of times I always be like, like, so, um, like I would, I don't, I don't remember my dreams ever, but like I would, if I was like those like dazing off or dozing off, I would like have like visions of like elderly dead people. I'm like, I don't like this. So yeah. now I don't have those. And that was just a way that I could psychologically, um, do that. And that's like a barrier that I put up for myself. So like, and other traumatic things I can just forget it. The way I write people off is the way I write like traumatic incidents off. And maybe one day, like they're bedded down there and they're going to come out, but yeah. it's been 16 years on the job and they haven't like came to the surface yet. So hopefully that's a good thing. Hey guys, if you're enjoying the street cop podcast, do us a favor and go with, give us a review on iTunes or Spotify, wherever you're listening to us, tell a friend, we don't charge anything for the episodes. We appreciate your support. Check us out on any social platform by putting into the search bar street cop training, give us a follow. We have a lot of free content coming out every single day that you might not catch here on the podcast. And it's important for you to be able to do your job more professionally. And we also entertain you as well. Yeah, man, I'm, a, I'm envious of that. <laughs> it, it's just, uh, Oh man, it, it's been two weeks for me. It really has. And, you know, uh, you think you're in charge of your feelings and you know what you're doing the right thing. And then things just change. And I'm at work, uh, two weeks ago, two and a half weeks ago now, I guess. And I get a, I get a message and then I get a call and I come to find out that my ex-husband is a barricaded subject in a house. Right. And the person that's responding and first on scene is a sergeant in a town that I teach with and I'm very close with. I talk to him every day. And the detective that is responding, I also teach with. And the local cop that's come in to try and talk to him and negotiate went to the academy with him and I, because my ex-husband, we met in the police academy. And then the trooper that's coming uh, in order to actually do crisis negotiation is the one that arrested him the first time with my incident. Right. And I'm like, oh, I was like, he is going to make a friend of mine kill him. Like that's going to happen. And I'm going to have to have this conversation with my kids about how a cop had to kill their father. Right. And think about all the trauma that that was going to create possibly. And I come to find out the reason he's barricaded is because he had uh, assaulted his new wife, strangled her, threatened to kill her. She got out of the house. And for eight hours, he was barricaded uh, till the state police teams came in and got him out and he went to jail. And Anybody that had ever spoken to my ex-husband knew that he was never going to go back to jail. Like his whole thing was, I will kill myself before I go back to jail. And that's actually what precipitated this because pending charges for what he did to my son, he, uh, he was getting offered a plea deal. And so I just think he broke even more than he was. And, uh, so he ended up waiving his right to release. And, uh, a week and a half ago, he hung himself at the jail and killed himself. And, uh, yeah, yeah. Your ex-husband? My ex-husband. I didn't know that. Yeah. Well, I mean, it wasn't really completely out there, but it's like, you know, we talk about this trauma and, and you talk about how you separate yourself. And I, for the first time, am really feeling like I don't even know how to feel. And there's all this trauma that's now come back, right, that I didn't expect to even have. Because how are your kids? I'm, I'll, get, I'll get to that in one second. No, 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 that's okay. Because my son now reminds me so much of something you just said. But, you know, you you talk about like maybe trauma coming back. I realized for the first time, my first shift back, I so after everything happened with my ex-husband, my very first call back was a domestic. And then with this one, my very first call back was an attempted suicide. Mm. It's like, all right, God, I, I got it, <laughs> right? Like, <laughs> I get it. Uh, but I walked out of headquarters that night and I always 
kind of have my head on a swivel whenever I walk anywhere because I'm always, you know, watching my surroundings. It's what we should do, yeah, right. especially with cops just being assassinated. But uh, I realized for the first time that for 14 years, I have been looking to see if my ex-husband was in the parking lot. And I, I never consciously knew that, right? And so I walk out into the parking lot and I just started to cry because I was like, I am so relieved someone is dead right now. And how horrible do I feel being the person that I am to think that way? And, you know, I had prepped my kids before he, uh, he waived his right to release. I said to them, I go, you, you, you need to be prepared that this may happen. Uh, he's not going to be in jail. And I don't know why I said that to them. Like we have a very good relationship, me and my kids, but my son was kind of like, oh, whatever. And my daughter was like, yeah, okay. And th luckily she is a therapist. So I was like, start working on this now, just in case, right? Like come up with a plan on how to, I don't know, just get through it. And, uh, you know, when I, it was Sunday morning, not this past Sunday, the one before, and I got a phone call and I knew, like, I, I just knew that he was dead. Uh, and the weirdest part is I woke up during the night at the time he mm -hmm. was pronounced, which is really weird, like almost to the minute. And I, I, I believe in weird things, but I don't know what I believe in sometimes, but I, I, I see signs, but you know, I told my son and, and I've been talking to him and, and it sounds very cold and I worry about it, but he basically said, you know, he was dead to me already in April. So this is really nothing, right? This is, there's so much like what you're saying. He's uh, uh, going to be 15. I'll, I'll tell you a story too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So he, you know, he was just like, you know, he's, he's been out of my life now. And my daughter hadn't seen him in a few years. Like she saw him on Easter morning and gave him a hug, but hasn't spent time with him. Right. Again, his relationship did not serve her in a way that made her feel good about herself. And, uh, that's a lot of trauma too. And she's not dealing with it as well. And so here I am being the cop and the mom and the victim and the survivor and the ex-wife and all the things with all these feelings and still trying to be a cop and show up at work. And uh, I have all these obligations and I feel really relieved and really angry and really happy and really sad and really just there's all these emotions. I'm so grateful for my therapist because he's just great. But again, there's all these things that come along with this and it's just not something that I ever thought I would really have to experience. And now I'm I'm worried about like Christmas with my daughter and his birthday and her birthday and proms and weddings. And not that she would have, it, the choice has been taken from her, right? Like selfishly. And now she has to be, now she has to make the choice. And we talk about like, I hate this man. Like, and I don't hate anybody. I really, really hate this man. And I am really glad he is gone because now I, there's, my life is just easier. I don't have to worry about getting a lawyer for sole custody. I don't have to worry about him like someday getting out of jail and wanting to be a part of their life and then worrying about that trauma. There, you know, there's all these things that are, my life is enhanced because he is gone. And on top of it now, I know he'll never hurt anybody else. Cause I was that like, as a cop who tries to save people's lives and enhance people's lives, yeah. So frustrating to see him continue to be able to hurt people. And then I just feel like a shitty human because he is, you know, my kid's father. And, you know, I picture him, you know, and what happened. And it's just, I had to make a choice. And this choice has been really hard. And it's something that I have to continue to think to myself. But instead of knowing him for the coward that he was because he couldn't be held accountable for his actions, uh, I am choosing to see what he did as a gift. And I'm choosing to see the good in him, that that was the thing that he did in order to save other people and that he knew that he had no control over who he was and who his life, what his life would be and that he had lost control and he was too weak to do anything about it. And so again, we talk about choices, right? And, and I could hate him. I could continue to hold on to that, but that's like me drinking poison that I wanted for mm -hmm. somebody else to die. Right. But it's just, it's not easy. And it's all this shit being unpacked. And I'm really, really lucky to be with an agency right now where we are a family and they really care. And, and I mean, just the way it's been handled has been like, I actually didn't dread going into work when I went back in and it was almost like a reprieve to go in. Of course, my first call ends up being like, and my guys tried, they were like, LT, you can just stay in the office and we'll handle it. But then it was going to be a use of force and it was all the things. But, you know, I just I'm just really again, it's about having all the resources and the tools. And 
I mean, Dennis was just unbelievable. And, you know, I, I kept my kids out of school and I brought them here because I had to, you know, get some, some merch for, for something. And like, he's just like throwing stuff at them because, you know, Dennis doesn't really know how else to be sometimes. And, right. uh, you know, everybody's just, again, when you surround yourself with the right people, and I, and I love it because Tom Rizzo says it all the time, right? If you surround yourself with people that don't help enhance your life, it's not a circle. It's it's a cage. Yep. And I have such a big circle. And you talk about that introvert, extrovert. I've never really needed people. I always kind of handle shit on my own. Like I just, I process it. I deal with it. I'm the one who takes on people's burdens. I don't put them on other people. And I feel very guilty doing that to others. I'm the same way. Yeah. And uh, man, the circle of people I have around me that have just really come in for me and my family in a way that they don't. I would have never accepted before that. Like I, I can see that I've grown from all of this too. So that was a whole lot of verbal diarrhea, but no, no, yeah. That, I mean, so that's, a. I mean, I think the way you're looking at it as a, as a, as a blessing is, as people won't understand that I feel. And, and, but I think that's the right way to look at it. And I hope that's the way, that's the reason he did it. It's not his own selfish reasons. It's, it's because he knew that, for whatever reason, he didn't have self-control and he was going to hurt someone or kill them. And, um, that was his way of getting out of that situation. So he didn't, he's only hurting himself in his own mind. I mean, yeah. I mean, he's hurting you and, and the kids selfishly and his family and, and friends or whatever. But if he knew that his mentality was that I cannot control myself in these situations. And I've done this to three people that I've loved it's only going to get worse from here. And this is my, my way out it sucks. And it's sad, but I mean, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know what, but I think your way of looking at it as a blessing is probably the best way to, that's the way I would deal with it. Honestly, yeah. that's the way I would process it because I, I couldn't look at it and think of the negative stuff or anything along those lines because then it would just eat me up. Yeah. But then you talked about your son that said he was dead from in, 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 in April when I was, um, there's certain family members in my life when I was 15, um, I just stopped seeing them. And then, uh, when I was 19, one of my family members, uh, based on the, the drug issue and the substance abuse issue, uh, was in the hospital and I, and I was told that, uh, they were going to pass away. So at the age of 19, I went and I, uh, at that point, that person basically, um, you know, I said my goodbyes and, and that person at that point pretty much was, uh, had passed at, at that time and, and, um, come to find out they lived through it. But, uh, our relationship from that point, from the time I was 15, but definitely from the time I was 19 has never been the same. And, uh, that person still abuses narcotics. And, uh, I always tell my wife, if, if that person was to stay clean and come to me and to try to have a relationship, that is the one person that, you know, God bless me with ability. But I was like, it would have to be a period of time where that person stayed off substances before I would even entertain, uh, re-engaging that relationship. So, um, for him to write it off that way and say like that, that's the way I dealt with it. And then that makes, that's, it might be a good thing actually. It's like that your son's like, he's dead from me from this point on like that. Yeah. So this won't have an impact hopefully on him for, yeah. Yeah. It's crazy though that, that time you said and therapy it. will tell. <laughs> you know, yeah, and he's not a kid who wants to go to therapy. Right? I never like, did. Uh, yeah, and I. So when everything happened with my ex husband, I went to see a therapist for the first time, and that person was like, "What happened to you in your childhood to make you allow this to happen?" I was like, "See a piece, I'm out." Mm -hmm. And then I found, and I feel like finding a therapist is like dating. You really can't just go to one. I mean, you might click right away, and you know, it might be like you know, your first or whatever. But I really think you need to date a bunch of therapists till you find the one that's right for you, because this is one of the most intimate times of your life that you're going to talk. And that hour is just for you. And you have to be OK being selfish about it, too. Right. Because I think as someone who tries to be very non-selfish, unself unselfish, mm -hmm. uh, when I walk into therapy, I, I still want to talk about other people and making other people better. And it, it took some time for me to be like, no, this is about me and it's OK to be about me and. And, uh, but my son was very much like, don't make me go to therapy. I go, that's no problem. Like I I'm good with it because you and I have a relationship and you talk to me about it. And, and if I can tell, but I go, you know, you start getting dark or you start doing no, yeah. some things I go, you're going. And he's like, okay, that's a deal. So, you know, it's, it's crazy. Cause you just, 
it's like having a squad. When I mean, I have four kids, and it's like having my own squad because all four of them are just so different, and I have to approach everything, and I have my ways of doing it. And when it's your kids, you try to kind of push your ways of handling things on them to help them cope and be able to handle it, and it's just it never turns out how you expect it to. And all you know, personalities are different, and they're going to do it. One hundred percent. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But then you know, it's there's just such ripple effects with all of it because, you know. My, my number three, my daughter, she is my number three and number four there with my second marriage. Right. And so they've never seen anything other than like a loving couple. Like my husband and I literally have never fought. I'm not even just saying that, like we'll argue about some things, but it's not, it's, it's just a difference of opinion. We've literally never had an argument at all. And I just, it was one of my prerequisites when we started dating. I'm like, you'll never yell at me. I'll never yell at you. You'll never call me a name. I'll never call you one. If we disagree about something, it won't happen in front of the children. Like it was just, and at 22 years old, when I started dating him with two kids and divorced from a psycho, he's like, okay, yeah, he's easy. He's just like the greatest. So they have that, but now like they know, they hear, they see things. They, it doesn't necessarily always make sense. And like, they ask the most innocent questions. So we had to tell them, listen, like, Amber and Hunter's father is gone. And, uh, you know, then they go, well, is he in heaven? And I'm like, um, <laughs> I don't know how to answer that question because he sure as shit isn't. Um, I said, you know, he's just, he's, uh, I don't know where he is. I just, I know he's not here anymore. And, you know, my youngest was like, what? I thought he was in jail. How can he die in jail? And I was like, oh man, here we go. Right. And it's just, and then Addison, my number three, she was like, having nightmares about her own father um, because of what she heard that he had done. Right. And she had like overheard some things. Uh, yeah. And the only person she can equate that to is my husband because he, she's, he's the only father she's known. And so it's like working through these things. And then he feels some sort of way. Cause he's like, why is she thinking bad about me? And I'm like, cause you're the only person she can relate to a dad. Like she's never even seen him. You know, she doesn't know. She doesn't know what that's about. And it's just, it's, you know, it's just working through it all. And it's just, you know, and I, I realize that there are people out there that aren't dealing with as much as I'm dealing with. And so people will be like, just like you are, I'm so sorry. And what I went through isn't anywhere near what you went through. And that's not true. Like we all, it's a lot of what, <laughs> what we go through is what we go through. Yeah. I mean, that's right. That, yeah. But yes, I, I, yeah, but like the so small you, things that I've dealt with, they it don't, they don't, they, but it's still impactful. Yes. I, it yeah. has an impact, but it's not yeah. the, 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 I guess the, the amount of impact it has on someone's life is. Yeah. It's way different, I feel. Yeah, but I have women that come up to me after class and they're like, now I wasn't hit as much as you were. That's or, not, hit once I, is good enough. Like that's I, what I'm saying. Like, and that, yeah, that's... it's like, no, it's not even about that. I wasn't really hit that much either by my ex husband. Like it, when he went in, he went all in, right? Like it wasn't like, you know, he'd slap me and, and all these things. It was a lot more verbal and mental and financial and all the things. And, you know, there are many victims there. I mean, they, this was his fourth wife that he only had known for a couple of weeks and then married her and they weren't together very long. And he did this. And, you know, there was his third wife, they were together 10 years and she dealt with it. His second wife, they were together like seven months. They dealt with it, you know, and then there's, you know, he has a kid with the other one. So there's, you know, there's all these layers of things. And I don't know, I just, I think when you and I were talking and I, I started to realize that there was more to you than just being, you know, the interdiction king the That's red true, ninja, uh, that there's so many more layers, right? And so many people want to see you for just that. And you're just so much better than that. And you're so, you have all these layers that make you who you are and you're human. And some people look at you we like are. you're not. And which is weird for us because, yeah. you know, yeah, we share who we are and, and what we are, but you know, this, this profession is made up of many humans mm -hmm. who have experiences that make them who they are and, and how they approach police work. And yeah. no, I, I completely agree there. And, and, and that's the thing. It's like, I think that it makes me more empathetic and understanding of people that are, are doing things or, or anything along those lines. It's like the, the avenue of where they're at and how they got there. It, it's indifferent to me, it's, but I, I, I can sympathize or be empathetic with where they're at in that, in that current moment. Um, so for me, I feel like all cops that have, I think everyone, everyone in society has been through some traumatic thing. It's traumatic to them in some way. There's yeah. no doubt about it. So I don't want to make it seem like mine is like so crazy that no one's ever had that. But I also want like, don't use that as a crutch. Use that as something that's positive and you can move forward from it. I feel that a lot of people will use that as like a whoa me type moment when I yeah. try to use it as like something that motivates me to be better at everything I do because I don't want to end up like that. Yeah. 
I'm, I'm actually going to ask a question because I know people are going to want to know the answer to this because I deal with um, some people sometimes in their backgrounds that just can't get hired because they have been arrested or even like written in underage drinking, right? And when you have other candidates that have nothing reported, right, doesn't mean that they don't have anything. They just weren't caught. Right. How did you transition from from or have the conversation with a potential employer regarding what you went through? I just, uh, so for me personally, like, um, I was still in college. I started applying at police departments when I was 20. I got charged in, when I was 22 with drinking related stuff, but I had been applying at a million different departments. So when I was 22, so I was graduating college, I graduated college in four and a half years and I was almost to my graduation. And at that point I was just going to start applying everywhere no matter what. But when that happened, I stopped applying and then I doubled down and I just literally like applied everywhere. And I'm not talking like everywhere I wanted to be. It was any place that would accept an application. I was going and applying. I was on a rotation of just testing every fucking police department possible. And I'm not joking. It probably, it took me three years to get hired um, because of my own mistakes. Like, and it wasn't anything that was that great, but you know, it, it, it was a blemish on, on my, uh, on my, criminal history, I guess. And then, uh, a blemish and you know, it's a, a blemish in my, my life and I made a mistake and it is what it is, yeah. but you kind of own it. And, um, yeah, it was just, I was very up, up front and open with it. A lot of departments based on when I started to apply and how recent that charge was, were always like, man, you're great, but no, too soon, too soon, too soon. I'm like, cool. Well, I'm going to go to the next one and I'm gonna go to the next one. I just kept going and going. And then finally three years after that, um, at the, my current department, I applied with them four times, and they finally hired me. And look at this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I use all that stuff as more motivation. Like, uh, it makes me appreciate this job more. It makes me love this career. It was so hard for me to get into it. I made my own mistakes that also hindered me. Um, some of my childhood things, all these things that like people could use as a crutch, I literally use them as like my powers to motivate me. It keeps me motivated. I've been doing a job for 16 years and I literally love going to work. I, I don't yeah. know. I, I, I literally love going to work every single day. I think that's so important, especially leaders of organizations to just listen to that because again, when somebody works really hard for something, they value it more. And when something comes really easy to somebody, it doesn't mean as much, right? So, you know, again, you've got athletes that just it was really a natural athletic ability. And then you've got someone like Michael Jordan who, you know, didn't even make the basketball team and had zero. I mean, obviously he has a natural athletic ability, but he had no talent, no training. And then boom. And I don't care. Anybody can fight me on this. I will fight you. He's the greatest basketball player of all times. Absolutely. LeBron James, if you're hearing me, I don't care. <laughs> Uh, it is, it's Michael Jordan of all time. He's just mm -hmm. the best of the best, uh, yeah. mindset wise, attitude wise, leadership wise, just all the things that you want in somebody. So again, for people who are leading organizations, they, they tend to shy away from people who have things in their past. And what they need to realize is that's going to make a more holistic police officer. That's empathetic. That's loyal. That's just excited to be there and, and doesn't take it for granted. And that's my thing. Like, uh, through this process, I was so frustrated. I, I was getting frustrated. I'm not gonna lie. I wasn't like, I'm not going to do this. I was just very frustrated. It was, it was long and it was hard. And, but I kept my goals where I wanted them to be. And I just kept going and going, but I said, whoever hired me, I don't give a I, I didn't care where it would be. I was going to stay there. I, I, I'm not, I, I wasn't going to leave because of the, I guess the, the loyalty they showed to me, I was going to repay it. And, um, my first six years, I had six different chiefs and it was, uh, the unknowing coming in is what made it rocky. Not that I, I, I was just happy to be there. I just wanted to take bad guys to jail. They left me alone. Uh, every administration there was just fine with that. There was a lot of up higher ups that would tiff, but like that was not, I, I didn't care. Like I, I have my uniform, I have a car, I'm going to go arrest bad guys. I don't care what you guys do up there. So yeah. it didn't really affect me at all, but the stability after my first six years has been amazing. And I mean, I can't say anything bad about any of my administrations personally, department wise, yeah, but Personally, they, they kind of left me alone, let me do my thing, knew that I just wanted to take bad guys to jail, that I have supervisors that would uh, bust my balls just because of the way I policed because I would just, you know, stop a lot of cars and hopefully get lucky because I didn't know what I was doing. Uh, but I wanted to take bad guys to jail. Did they bust my balls? Absolutely. Um, but that motivation for me to even, I don't know, the motivation to, I'm very competitive, so the motivation to be successful in law enforcement motivated me and kept me motivated throughout through 
good and bad times. Like motivation to go there, set, set short-term goals, set long-term goals. And that's like, uh, the self-motivation is the only what kept me going. But, uh, I've had, uh, you know, an amazing career so far. And my administration has been one of the best. Like honestly, even through, what is that? Like eight chiefs, nine chiefs in 16 years. And it's a lot, but you know, and all different personalities. And I, I, I feel that I stayed who I was and just, this is what I want to do in my life and my career. Um, and I think that's why I kind of why like they, they appreciated me. I was just very self-motivated and they knew where my mind was and what I wanted to do. Yeah. I love it. I mean, I'm just so grateful for you. I am. I, I, I'm really, really grateful for the friendship that I have. It's insane that I can be on a car stop and at my fingertips is, uh, the red ninjas, you know, cell phone number or Rizzo or Brad. I just, I feel very grateful, but it's not just me. Like everybody has that option because you just put yourself out there. But I mean, thank you for being vulnerable. I know that's not always easy. And yeah, listen, I get a lot of positive feedback from some of these podcasts from people who are like, oh man, it's so nice to hear a cop talk about the struggles that they're going through too, which, you know, sucks that we even have to talk about it. I wish everything was sunshine and rainbows, but thank you. And I'm, I'm just so grateful for you. No, I'm grateful for you. I, um, I feel, yeah, I don't like this, but I, I feel bad for, um, I think what drew me in, I knew who you were, I knew what you taught, but hearing that first podcast you did drew me in you. And now I'm like, I was like, the cop of me is like, I'm going to protect you. Like, that's my goal. Like from here on out, like, like this will never happen again. So, uh, my wife doesn't even listen to the podcast. Like even when I'm like, you want to listen to this? Like, no, I, 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 she listened to your entire one and she's like, oh, I see why you like her. So oh. like, uh, yeah, like I appreciate you being my friend. I appreciate you always just, you know, being vulnerable, which sucks. And I hate hearing it, but, uh, if you've made it through, maybe someone else can take yeah. that as a, you know, a positive thing and not use it as a crutch. Thank you. No, thank you. Guys, if you're in an area where you're trying to get to our classes, but we're not close to you, fret not. We actually have on-demand training at streetcop.com. You can take that course online right now, and then you could attend that training in the future at no additional cost. You can redeem your voucher. So you get two for the price of one. We don't want to deny you the ability to take this training now, especially knowing that it can keep you safe at a very minimum, putting bad guys in jail where they belong, and at the maximum, going home to your family. Check out streetcop.com for that offer.